Welcome back to another episode of ICOC and ICC Shenanigans. Today, we're going to be doing a live response video to what's called the light and darkness study. The ICOC and ICC both have something called the first principle studies. As far as I know, that's the name that they still use for them. But these are a series of indoctrination studies that one must undergo in order to be baptized into the church and considered a member, which in their eyes means being a disciple of Christ and, and also means as a result that they are saved and going to heaven. So this is the holy grail, their, their process. And this video is of a video where the leader in the church here, his name is Mike, It's one of the most notoriously toxic leaders in the International Christian Church. But this is also taught in the ICOC. So one of the things that they teach is something called light and darkness. And we're going to watch and listen to a recording of the light and darkness study being taught to the congregation by the the elder or pastor whatever his i think he's the lead evangelist but it, we're going to go piece by piece and unpack this because light and darkness is one of the more traumatic studies that are inflicted on people even when people don't go through with baptism. There are people I've spoken to personally that have been scarred by this experience. And we'll see why when we go through the psychological manipulation and, and trauma that, that is occurring here. And this is, this is a course, um, this is probably a midweek service where you know, the members of the church are being trained, quote unquote, how to go out and recruit other people using these Bible studies. So without further ado, let's go. Um, I know we talked a little bit about this when we did the discipleship study, but uh, Jacoby, how old are you? Jacoby is the name of the hypothetical person that they are studying the Bible with. And he is going to say the name Jacoby. So when you hear him say that, that's who he's referring to. He's using a hypothetical male who he is doing the light and, start, light and dark study with. And we're going to see kind of like a little straw man situation where he's going he's gonna to use this Jacoby fictional character and, and his, his objections and his life. And, and they're just going to... They're going, he's going to use Jacoby to demonstrate how you indoctrinate and manipulate someone. And, and also how you break a person's will and break them down. So, let's hit play. And he says, like, 23. 23, okay. <laughs> so we make a lie. And different people do this different ways. I just do it like this. I put 23, and then, you know, here's where he was born, right? I say, awesome. So, Jacoby, I want to talk about spiritually significant events in your life. Uh, also important to note is what he's doing right now is called a timeline. So, for some people, they do this in the Seeking God study. But when I was being recruited, they, they did this in the Light and Darkness study. So, this is also done in the Seeking God study. But in the Light and Darkness study they do a timeline where they ask, just like he asked Jacoby, how old are you now? And he said 23. And then he draws a line, you know, at, at the end of the timeline. So that's the present. And then they're going to go all the way back and, and, and he's going to explain it. But I just want everyone to know that what he's doing is walking the, the person through an actual timeline of events in their lives. Um, at what point do you believe that you became a Christian? 
and he might say, uh, back when I was, you know, seven, uh, I think around then is when I came to believe, okay? And so I'll put seven years old, and then I'll ask, uh, what happened at that point? Now, again, a lot of times at this point, they, don't, they already understand they're not a true disciple or maybe never became one, but it's still good to go through and go, okay, what did you think prior to us studying the Bible? When did you think you became a Christian? You hear the language he's using, the arrogance, the audacity, as he so flippantly says, because the assumption is, yeah, oh yeah, you know he's not a disciple. He's not saved. So they're going into the study with the person with that assumption already there. They're operating from that assumption and belief. So it's already, we are right, that person is wrong, we're lost, we're saved, they're lost. So when, when they're asking the person about their life, the spiritual events in their life, something about this is so just wrong. It's very evil because, you know, they, people are opening up and sharing. When you talk about the spiritual events in your life, that's a very deeply personal thing. And they're turning it into a timeline, which by the way, for anyone who has gone to a psychiatrist or a therapist, any kind of mental health professional, one of the techniques that's used that is, can be effective is using timelines with people. And so it's really problematic that they have incorporated that into these Bible studies. But it makes sense because they are psychologically manipulating people. And, and people need to be aware that this is what's happening. For those who may be in the process of studying the Bible right now with this group, whether it's the ICOC or ICC, or if you're recovering from being in this group, understanding what happened, happened to you, you know, unpacking it and understanding that all of this is significant. It, it, it really, it, it just unpacks how the indoctrination happened. And we talk about that in a lot of other videos, but in this situation, hear the language that he's using and the arrogance and the, the narcissism of, hey, you know, we are we're right and you're wrong. We already know you're not saved, you know, but let's go through this because we know already, we just need to get this person to realize they're not saved. Let's go. You get what I'm saying? So just talk to them depending on where they're at. Um, like, okay, so what happened at seven? He goes, well, I went to this church camp one time uh, with my friends and I remember, uh, you know, there was a sermon that was preached. I remember that night crying a lot, and I felt like, uh, you know, God had touched my heart, and I became a Christian. I go, okay, great. So I'll write down church camp experience or something like that, right? And then I'll go, great. Uh, when were your sins forgiven? I goes, well, I guess then? I go, okay, cool. And a lot of times they don't know what this stuff means, you know what I mean? But you're just kind of asking them, so I'll put sin forgiven. I'll go, okay, great. Did you ever receive uh, the Holy Spirit? And he'll go, um, yeah, I mean, when I was in high school one time, I was praying in my room, and I felt like a presence come in, and so I think that's when I received the Holy Spirit. Okay, how old were you? He goes, uh, 16 or something. Okay, so over here we'll go, 16, Holy Spirit. I'll put presence in his room. You know, that sort of thing, right? And then um, uh, I might ask a question, uh, were you ever water baptized at any point? And he goes, yeah, I was. I think it was, it was when I got back from that church camp. I was still seven years old. I think it was like two weeks later that the pastor said I should do it uh, to declare my faith to the congregation. I said, okay, cool. So we'll do seven again, and I'll say water baptized two weeks later. Seven. Any other spiritually significant events that you go through? And you get all kinds of stuff. I mean, I've had people that claim they were, you know, laid on the floor, 
slain in the spirit with angels around us. And that's, a that's true. Uh, so this is not the time to argue. Do you hear them laughing at people who claim, quote unquote, to be slain in the spirit? People who have who, who have had spiritual experiences. Do you hear the mockery and the arrogance as they're laughing at people? Time to argue people's experiences or go, oh, that's not true or whatever. You're just gathering information because you're going to use this at the end of the study if they fight you. They don't fight you, you don't really need it. You get what I mean? Hold up. Let's play that again. Time to argue people's experiences or go, oh, that's not true or whatever. You're just gathering information because you're going to use this at the end of the study if they fight you. If they don't fight you, you don't really need it. You get what I mean? What do you say now? Run that back. You're going to use this at the end of the study if they fight you. You're going to use this at the end of the study if they fight you. Now he said, you're going to use this information that you're getting from this person against them at the end of the study if the person fights back if they fight you. So what is what he's literally saying is get all the personal information you can from this person to use against them as a weapon. So they're going to weaponize this person's past spiritual experiences against them. And you're telling me people who insisting that this church isn't that bad that you know, all the different types of pushback and denial people give that these people are not sick. This is not a cult. Let's continue. Yeah. They don't fight you, you don't really need it. You get what I'm saying? But it's just a good resource to keep. So if you did it during the discipleship study uh, prior to that, which I recommend, that's what I usually do, to be honest. But if you do it prior to the discipleship study, don't lose it. You get what I'm saying? Because right. you'll want to keep that later on. Because oftentimes people will like retroactively change what they, they said to kind of fit what you're teaching them. Uh, because they want to be part of the group or whatever. And you want this written down because it's really what they believe about their own theology. You know what I'm saying? Or their own um, uh, beliefs about God. Make sense? Okay, cool. I wasn't going to comment on this, but I think it's important to hear what he just said. That you're, you're doing the timeline, you're gathering the per information from this person on themselves. Because the goal is that you want to hold that this against them to throw this in their face essentially because it's it's a weird twisted thing they understand that it's indoctrination because he's saying people will morph their answers because they want to be in the group so they already are aware of that it's this carrot that they dangle with the person you know, they're teaching the person that they're nothing without the group. If they're outside the group, they're lost. They're going to hell. But then, you know, so they're applying all of this psychological pressure and manipulation. But at the very same time, the church is, is making it hard for the person, you know, to get in the group. So it's like they're manipulating them into the group but they're also pushing back against the person so that that's why people who are in the group who haven't left the group, even though they, they know they need to, they say, well, it was hard to get in. It's not a cult because if it was a cult, they wouldn't have made it so hard for me to get in, in, into the group. When, it, when in reality, it's part of, of the process it's part of the abuse you have to break the person down and 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 what he's saying is we need to we need to know what your initial answers were because this is what you really think about your salvation so when you try and change it later in in the light and darkness study we can go wait a minute is this what you really believe so it's designed to make sure that the person is not just telling 
the ICOC or ICC members what they want to hear to get in the group or get baptized. And, and they're coming at this in the name of like it's some form of integrity, but it's not. It, it's about making sure that the indoctrination is solidified, that, you know, that you have completely, you really believe in their rhetoric and in their ideology, that you really do, you really have drank the Kool-Aid. It's like if it's Kool-Aid, they want to, you know, or if it's like a pill is a better analogy. If it's a pill, they want to make sure that you have it slid it under your tongue. They want they're gonna make sure that you've actually swallowed it. Okay, cool. So then we get into the study. Go oh, great. Thank you so much. We're gonna come back to that uh, later, Jacoby. Let's read here, First Peter chapter two, and verse nine. And this is written specifically to Christians, to people that are already saved. Why don't you go ahead and read it, Jacoby? Okay, it's okay. verse nine. And this is written specifically to Christians. The people are always saved. Let's read it. We are chosen people. 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 We and it says that we're a holy nation, meaning that our first affiliation isn't into any physical nation, but now when you're in God's kingdom, it's to God's kingdom. Amen? Amen. He says that you may declare the praise of him, so it's evangelistic in nature. And it says that they've been called out of what and into what when you look at this verse. He looks down and he goes, oh, called out of darkness and into light. You see? Yeah, so all of the yadi yadi you know, Bible verse, Bible verse. It, they're setting up, using the Bible, this concept of black and white thinking. And to a, a young person, like a college kid, like Jacoby, in this example, or anyone who does not have previous Bible knowledge or is very confident in their faith, whatever that may be, this can come across very convincing, especially someone like this who's presenting this to you in this way. It's, it's very, it can be very intimidating. And I remember doing the studies, feeling very intimidated, not having any real way to push back against what they're saying because I didn't have the Bible knowledge myself. And so that's really the ideal person that they like to study with, but what's happening now is they're setting it up. They're setting it up using the scriptures because they they anchor everything they teach to scriptures so that if you challenge it, then you're seen as challenging God. And, and that's why the word study was so important in the very beginning of the process. So now that you're at light and darkness, Typically, light and darkness is done right before getting baptized, when you're toward the end. And, and the purpose of light and darkness is essentially to show you that, one, that the Bible, well, one, that the ICOC and ICC, respectively, are God's kingdom. Both of them, you know, don't, both of them don't think the other one is, is but, you know, but they they each think that they're the one true kingdom and they're the only ones doing it right. So that's what he's doing brick by brick. He's laying the foundation in this person's mind that because we're the ones teaching this to you, there is this sort of psychological thing that happens where you think, well, this person or this group must be must be right because they're the ones that, that are teaching me this. And, and unless you read those same scriptures in that same way or had an opportunity to analyze it from in a different church or different place, it seems like you're learning something new or you're learning something important or significant that, you know, is, is the truth. You see, when God sees the entire world, he sees every single person, Jacoby, in one of two categories. 
Either they're in the light or they're in the darkness. Is there a gray area that you think you can be in or the little twilight zone area? No. He goes, no. It's so light and darkness. I go, exactly. Jesus is always absolute. You're building on the rock. You're building on the sand. You're going to heaven. You're going to hell. You're in the light. You're in the darkness. Amen. And so today we're going to talk about. Yep. See, they are laying down the cult black and white thinking. And they, they actually are saying this from the perspective of God, as if this guy or anyone in this church or any other human being can tell you what God is thinking as he's looking down on the earth and that God's a he at all, but that's a whole other topic. But the fact that, you know, it, it sounds pseudo logical. It's like, okay, is it black is white? This again, it, there is gray. And we have this innate desire for life to be simple. And it taps into that. Like we want so bad for there to be this absolute truth about everything. And because life can be confusing. And, and as a lot of times the church targets young people and vulnerable people who are in a life transition or a crisis and we're trying to figure out the world make sense of the world so this kind of thinking really is what hooks you and you get trapped in this all or nothing mentality and and then they connect it with bible scriptures and, and then they go okay light and darkness so everything he's doing here and in, in the study is setting the person up to to admit and declare themselves in the dark Today we're going to talk about how someone comes from darkness to light. Now, you'll look at this passage here, and this is where you'll want to draw um, another diagram. So you draw out, and these are diagrams I think are important to draw out, guys, just so, so you know. So you'll write over here, darkness, and again, I'm going to abbreviate uh, for time, but you'll write out darkness, and you'll draw a little chart here, and then light. And I'll say, you know, when you look at verse 10, notice in the darkness, he says, once you were not a people. So before you come into the light, you're not a part of the people of God. You're right, not a people. Of course, in the light, you're part of the people of God. And then, of course, it says in verse 10 that once you had not received mercy. So in the darkness, there's, there's no forgiveness for your sins. So no mercy. And in the light, there's forgiveness for your sins and mercy. And, of course, this brings us back then to our discipleship study, where this person's not a disciple. Of course, they're not a Christian. And, of course, they're not saved. And, of course, then in the light, they'd be a disciple be a Christian, they'd be saved. Now, the reason I draw this out is I like to then show this to them and go, okay, as of right now, which side are you on? Are you in the darkness or the light? And, of course, if the studies have gone smoothly so far, they'll go, oh, I'm in the darkness. Now, sometimes they like pointing right over here. Right. <laughs> Going back a few minutes to when he talked about using the scripture they were really drawing a picture between us versus them. And when they said you are a chosen priesthood, you are a royal priesthood, a chosen people, he was priming the person to accept the idea that the ICOC, or in this case, the ICC, depending on which church you're doing the Bible study with, you are being primed to accept that the ICOC or the ICC respectively are a royal priesthood. They are a chosen people. So it's us versus them. Do you want to be with us, the royal chosen, or do you want to be with them, the lost dark souls? So... 
now here comes one of the main tools used in the study. It's this diagram. And it's one of those really simple, uh, basic diagrams that illustrates the difference, you know, between light and darkness, you know, uh, mercy, not mercy, lost and saved. And this usually is effective because it's a visual representation of that scripture in first Peter that they talk about. So that's why they read the scriptures they do leading up to this point. There is a method to all of this. It is not done by happenstance. It is not an accident. It is intentional. Everything builds on everything else in this indoctrination process. So when they're doing this diagram with you, it seems like they are correct, that they're being truthful, that they are giving you a visual of what the scripture is saying in the Bible. So your brain is more likely to accept it. But what they are illustrating is cult black and white thinking, us versus them. You're either this or you're that. And to the brain, it might make sense. You know, we want simple truths. We want our truth simple and, and clear, clear cut. So this appeals to that. And they do it in such a way as this guy's doing it, it makes it seem like, of course, it's either one or the other. And, and, and I have to pick a side. So it puts this psychological pressure on the person and it makes them have to choose. And of course, no one's going to choose to be lost. No one's going to choose to be in the dark. And let's continue to see what he has to say. Now, sometimes what will happen is some people, because they're making changes and they're growing, they'll go, oh, I'm in the light now. No, well, no, you're not. You know, don't, don't do that. Because remember, uh, you haven't taught them exactly how to get saved yet. You just taught them what a saved person looks like. And they go, that's not me. When they say, I'm not a disciple, I'm not a Christian, I'm not saved. Are you with me right here? So if they say I'm in the light, I don't really freak out about it too much. I just go, okay, amen. Well, today what we're going to do is we're going to really see it, how we actually determine that. And today by the end of the study, you'll be able to tell for sure whether you're in the darkness or the light and how someone comes from darkness to light. So... The audacity of someone actually thinking that they're in the light coming into these studies. And I remember being a member of the ICOC and doing studies. And when someone would say I'm in the light, I get this knot in the pit of my stomach because I knew that that meant that they were quote unquote prideful and I was going to have to break them because that's the whole idea of this is when, when they're doing the studies, and I want anyone listening to listen close if you are in the Bible studies right now. If you are in the process or someone you love is in the process of being recruited into either the ICOC or the ICC, just know that the, the modus operandi is for them to convince you or the person you love that they are in the dark, that they are lost. And... You know, so this requires to break this person's ego, to break their will, to convince them that they have no relationship with God and that whatever they think they have spiritually is not good enough and it's not sufficient. And the sheer arrogance of what they're saying and how they're saying it in this video speaks volumes because that is how they actually feel. Let's talk about sin first. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 59. And how would you define sin, Jacoby? When you hear that term, what do you think of? And he goes, well, I think of it as maybe uh, doing something that displeases God. I go, I agree with that. I think that's a good definition. Uh, the word sin literally means to break God's law. It, it, it's being a lawbreaker. It literally can mean missing the mark, like an archery term. If you ever watch archery on, like, sometimes ESPN would have archery on, you know, ESPN2 and that stuff. And you'll see when they miss the mark, they get what's called a sin. 
And so, of course, our mark, Jacoby, is the Word of God. And when we don't get the Word of God, we don't live according to it, uh, we sin. <sighs> here we go. Now, here comes the Isaiah scripture. This is the one they hinge all their toxicity on when it comes to this. Now, there's much to unpack here, but I just want to mention when it comes to the idea of sin, they start out by asking the person what their definition of sin is. So that's a setup to begin with. Because most likely, unless the person is a theologian, they're going to give a very basic you know, idea of sin from their perspective. And just like Jacoby in this situation responded, was a very reasonable right answer, right? And, you know, right in quotation marks. But again, the ICOC's perception, as you see, is very legalistic when it comes to sin. This whole missing the mark definition, it sounds smart. And they're very good, whether it's the ICOC or the ICC, they're very good at sounding smart. So one of the ways they do this, and this isn't just the ICUC and ICC, this is a, a lot of Christian churches too that, that do this kind of stuff, where they, they try to sound smart by giving you know, the, the, the original Greek or Hebrew you know, language of a verse or the etymology of a word. So they'll be like, well, actually the word in the Greek means miss the mark. And it makes them sound smart, like they actually know. Most people studying the Bible, and for those of you who are doing a study right now, the person doing a study with you, are just they're just parroting what they were told. But regardless of if it means miss the mark or not, is not the point. It's the energy that the ICOC and the ICC come with. It's their intention behind it. You hear how they describe sin in this ominous way where it's like, okay, you're, you're messed up. You know, it's about obeying God. And that's, that's their view of God. You have to understand that their, their perception of, of God is this punishing authoritarian dictator. This very hard to please narcissistic father figure. The dad that you can never please. And that's the ICOC. It's like, you follow my rules. There is the God. God is the, God's the Godfather. He's the mob boss. You have to kiss his ring. So it's important to understand where they're coming from because two different people can read the same Bible verse and, and come away with two different interpretations of it. And so their, their teaching and beating into the minds of people their very toxic interpretation of God and of, you know, the concept of sin. But it gets worse. Let's continue. Uh, sin was not something created by God. I give the example for the more philosophical types that struggle with this stuff of, you know, if, you create, if I created and built a washing machine and I threw my clothes in it and the clothes came out in shreds, I didn't create it to do that. It malfunctioned. And so to sin is to malfunction. It's not to live according to your humanity. To be wow. human is to be truly sinless. That's actually what it means yeah. to be human. Whoa, wait a minute. To be human does not mean to be sinless. These are the kind of teachings that are so hard for people to undo after they hopefully escape from this organization. These are the kinds of erroneous, false, toxic teachings that sink deep into your subconscious. And, it, and you got to go to hell and back to get that out. Because to sin is to, to be human is to make mistakes. To be human is to be imperfect. There's an ancient saying that says to err is human. And, and this is so wrong, but they say things like this with such authority and such confidence that 
for young kids like Jacoby sitting there, they just might believe it, you know, and this is a lie. This is a full flat out lie. And he's saying this with a straight face. No, T to be human means to be complicated, to make mistakes, to not be perfect. And he's flipped it around and said to be human means to be sinless. And this is how they really create this perfectionistic culture of this cookie cutter disciple that you just spend every waking moment of every day trying not to sin, i.e. miss the mark against God, not to make errors because, you know, because of this kind of teaching. When we are human, we're going to make mistakes. We are going to have a dark side, a light side, a shadow side. You know, we're going to have a full range of emotions. We're not just going to be happy and grateful. We're also going to be, you know, angry and sad and everything in between. So this is a flat out lie. And let's, let's keep going because my blood pressure is going up. And that's why there's peace and, you know, order and all that when we're sinless. Mm -hmm. To sin is to break God's law. Now in Isaiah 59, in verse 1, it says, Surely the arm of the Lord is not too short to save, nor is ear too dull to hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you, so that you will not hear. Okay, okay, so Jacoby, when you look at this passage, the Bible says that people aren't lost because God's arm's too short, and it's using kind of poetic language. Like, it's not God's fault that people are lost. Right, right. He goes, but man has something. They have a problem that causes separation from God. According to this passage, what separates man from God, Jacoby? And he looks and he says, are iniquities? What's that? I go, oh, it's a good question. Iniquities is just another word for sin. In the Hebrew, iniquities deals more with like habitual sin or lifestyle sin. Um, but the word sins is there again, a different word. Of course, if you look on, he says your sins have hidden his grace from you. So the idea is that all sin separates man from God. So, of course, you'll draw another diagram here. We'll keep our timeline just in case we need it for Jacoby. Come on, Jacoby. I got you. So, you know, you can imagine you got kind of two rooms here. And you have a wall. And Jacoby, you're here, you're sad because you're in the darkness. So. <laughs> you hear these people in the audience? You hear how they're laughing? They think this is funny. And you think if, if going to hell was such a serious matter, if, if what they're preaching and believing is so true, then this would not be funny in the slightest. And, and they're mocking and, and their response is, is disgusting. But that's part of the indoctrination too. But yeah, they have to hold that L because the audience's response tells you everything you need to know. All of our sins in, in a pile, if you will. Your person A, let's say the only sin you ever done in your entire life, or did in your entire life, was you stole a candy bar in elementary school. That was it. So your, your sin pile is like right here. Let's pretend, you know, I'm person B, maybe, and, you know, Typical guy, maybe smoked, partied a little bit, slept around, but you know, I have a good job, managed my life well. Amen. I'm right here. Went through my young years, now married. Cheat on my wife maybe once. God's conditions for forgiveness. This is at the heart of the ICC and ICOCs view of God and, and their whole theology. Everything is very black and white by the rules. The ICC and ICOC are the Pharisees in the New Testament gospel. They're the ones that, the ICOC and ICC are the Pharisees in the gospel 
who criticized Jesus for breaking the Sabbath, for washing his hands or not washing his hands. I forget which one. They were the ones dictating these conditions on God's behalf. And, and Jesus, to me, represented the heart of God, where the Pharisees represented the rules. And that's what the ICOC and ICC are. They represent the rules in, in you know, um, legalities of salvation and Christianity. And this is why when they teach these studies, this is where they're coming from. Imagine for a moment, so we're gonna have another diagram here. A lot of diagrams in this, this uh, study here. I want you to imagine for a moment that Jacoby, you're person A, and if we could pile up all of our sins in, in a pile, if you will. You're person A, let's say the only sin you ever done in your entire life, or did in your entire life, was you stole a candy bar in elementary school. That was it. So you're, your sin pile's like right here. Let's pretend, you know, I'm person B, maybe, and, you know, typical guy, maybe smoked, partied a little bit, slept around, but, you know, I have a good job, managed my life well, amen. I'm right here. Went through my young years, now married. Cheat on my wife maybe once. Let's pretend uh, Kevin is in Romans 3, uh, perhaps a familiar passage to, to many, in Romans 3, uh, and of course you're taking turns in the study here, so maybe it's Kevin's turn to read, and in verse 23, it says, for the wages are sorry, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as the sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. And goes, so according to this passage, Jacoby, who has sinned? Oh, goes, oh everybody. Oh, yeah. All have sinned. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment, so we're going to have another diagram here. A lot of diagrams in this, this uh, study here. I want you to imagine for a moment that, Jacoby, you're person A, and if we could pile up all of our sins in, in a pile, if you will. You're person A, let's say the only sin you ever done in your entire life, or did in your entire life, was you stole a candy bar in elementary school. That was it. So your, your sin pile is like right here. Let's pretend, you know, I'm person B, maybe, and, you know, typical guy, maybe smoked, partied a little bit, slept around, but, you know, I have a good job, managed my life well, amen. I'm right here. Went through my young years, now married. Cheat on my wife maybe once. <laughs> my bad. I had to run and do something. So it was, I let it play. There's so much problematic stuff that just happened. And starting from the last thing, I mean, the example about, yeah, he's cheated on his wife. You see, there's a lot of degeneracy among the, the leaders in the church, both male and female, but the males especially. Uh, it, the more you, you dig into this organization, whether it's the ICOC or the ICC, the more you find that that's not a joke. He thinks that's funny, but it's probably what he's doing right now. But as far as the light and darkness study goes, with all the diagrams, it just makes it seem like they're the teacher and the person is the student. And, and they're drawing these illustrations based on these scriptures. So it just seems like, I said this before, but it seems like they know more than they do. It comes across like they're knowledgeable of the Bible, that what they're saying is the truth. They're just illustrating what the scriptures say. But there's a twist and a bend behind it that catches people off guard. And you have to look at 
where they're coming from, what their intent is, because that's what they're using it for. And the whole idea throughout this study is to show the person that they are lost and going to hell. They are not in the light. They are sinners. They fall short of God. And of course, when you read that scripture in Romans 3 about we all fall short, I thought that he said a moment ago that it's okay that, you know, like part of being human is to not sin. So if we're human beings, which we are the last time I checked, then how how have we all fallen short of the glory of God if to be human means not to have error, not to sin, to be sinless is what he said. So how is that possible if we're human, but at the very same time, we're, we, we all fall short of the glory of God. But these are the kinds of things you, you don't catch in the moment. When you're an 18-year-old kid like Jacoby sitting in these Bible studies with these older men, and there's, there's a second guy he calls Stephen, who is a disciple who's sitting in on the study. So you're outnumbered. It's intimidating. You don't have the Bible knowledge. You don't have the, the, the self you know, the, the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, the critical thinking skills. You, you don't have your boundaries in place. You don't know who you are. You're still developing, you know, and you, unlike the ICOC or ICC, typically you're not coming into it thinking you have all the answers where they are coming into it thinking they do have all the answers. So you're outmanned, you're outmatched. And if you don't, have a really strong theological background, critical thinking, age, wisdom from living, being able to contrast ideas and, and flesh things out for yourself. If you're not strong in that, they're going to eat you alive. And this is what you're watching happening in real time. Uh, I Let's pretend uh, Kevin is like, oh, oh, a psychopath, serial killer, cannibal, rapist, pedophile. You want to force stuff you can think of, right? Worst things you can think of. Uh, according to this uh, passage, who's furthest away from God? Not the time so Jacoby will go, you know, instead of go, well, person C. Like, okay, well, let's look at the passage again. It says, for all have sinned. And fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace. And so He goes, "Oh, I guess all of them." Yeah, you know, one sin is enough to separate us from God. This whole one sin is enough to separate us from God is at the forefront of a lot of the abuse in the church, because the ICOC and the ICC use that to micromanage members to say no matter how quote unquote small your sin is, it put Jesus on the cross. Even if the, the worst thing you did was take a candy bar from the store once when you were nine years old, but you were perfect. You never sinned any other time in your life and you lived to be a hundred. You'd still go to hell because you stole a candy bar from the corner store. And something about that is just so problematic. It, it, it really goes to show the ICOC's dogmatic ideology and their lack of nuance and intellect. And just from a heart perspective, their, their understanding of God is so darkened that according to them and their interpretation of the Bible, that you would go to hell and burn for eternity for stealing a candy bar along with Hitler and Stalin and, and, any, and any pedophile and murderer and the worst of the worst, as we would say. You're telling us that those two things are equal in the eyes of God. And this is used to browbeat people, especially people who have a squeaky clean background according to, you know, society's moral standards. You know, people who haven't been in trouble, they, they've never really done anything. This is what they use to convince those 
kinds of people. And I was one of those people. I'll be honest. I was pretty green. You know, the worst, my worst confessions and sin and repentance study may be laughable to some people. But they used it to browbeat those of us from really squeaky clean backgrounds to say, number one, this is true. I want to say that for out front. No one's perfect. Like the all of sin to fall short of the glory of God. I mean, duh. Human beings are human. And part of being human is that we make mistakes. We do bad things sometimes. We, we do miss the mark. But number two is that I forgot what I, I forgot what I was saying. But you know, um, the point the point here is they use you know that 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 idea to say that no one can claim to be perfect or in the eyes of God that we all have to be humble. That and, and they use it to micromanage us so. You'll find yourself as a disciple browbeating yourself because you you drank the last bit of milk and you didn't replace it. You, you live with roommates in the church. Oh, I drank the last bit of milk and I didn't replace it. Or, you know, just all kinds of things. I mean, if you really, if you, it's like spiritual OCD. And, and I mean that in no offensive way to minimize actual, um, the actual disorder. But for those of you who know, know OCD, it's in a sense of every little thing, just how people are very, you know, um, to a point of a disorder, you know, with, with, with germs and, and things out of, out of place. That's how the ICOC teaches you through this kind of thinking with, with sin, with, you know, with your humanness. You go through every day missing the mark all day long, and you just browbeat yourself to death spiritually and psychologically over everything you do. I should have invited that person to church. I should have got up half an hour early to have my quiet time. I should have had a longer quiet time. I should have called back my discipler yesterday. I shouldn't have worn that top. It caused the brother to struggle. I shouldn't have, you know, it's like, you, you know, I shouldn't have gotten angry driving to work, you know, at that person. What would Jesus do? So it's all about just micromanaging yourself and beating yourself up. And this is how they perpetuate. This is where it starts right here with this teaching and a light and dark study Every little sin you do is no better than the worst sin. So now you have to spend your life beating yourself up for being human. And we learn from this passage a couple of things. I like to use the, an example, Jacoby, of um, you ever been to the Grand Canyon? And he goes, oh yeah, I went there when I was a kid or something, right? I find in the East Coast I've had to change my analogy a little bit because a lot of people haven't been to the Grand Canyon. So I'll, I'll give you another one here in a moment too. But I go, you know, imagine if all three of us were to run as fast as we can, and we're going to try to jump to the other side of the Grand Canyon. <laughs> now, the fastest of us, you know, which probably be me because I ran track and I'm pretty fast. <laughs> well, you want to try uh, <laughs> might get out the furthest. But at the end of the day, what's going to happen to us no matter how fast we run? We're all going to fall short. Well, we all die. doesn't matter how hard you run. And so... The idea of this passage is that a good moral life is not enough to save you. No matter how righteous you think you are in your best day, it's not enough to meet God's holy standard. This right here is another root of the problem, and, and, and it is the lifeblood of the church culture. No matter how good of a person you are morally, it will never be enough for God. Our righteousness are like filthy rags. So you never feel enough. You never feel saved enough. You never feel good enough for God. And as long as you're part of the ICOC or ICC, that never changes.